All right, well, welcome everyone to um, NHA's Community Connect Forum. We're happy that you have joined us. Um, today, we're gonna be discussing uh, clinical skills for medical assistance and creative options for externships. And you are in for a treat. We have a wonderful panel of industry leaders joining us today that are um, kind of living in the depths of COVID and how we are adjusting in the educational space to um, teach both simulation and externship skills and objectives in the current status. Um, so I know they are going to be able to share some really valuable information for you as to what maybe they have done um, for this summer session and what we are anticipating to see for the, the fall session as well. I do have to let you know that the examples that are going to be shared today are not meant to provide direction on what is approved or recommended by any um, state, national, or um, programmatic accreditor. Um, as we will not be discussing accreditation standards during today's call. However, if you like some of the alternatives or um, the solutions that the panelists share, we recommend that you check with your specific school, programmatic or state governing body to make sure or see if that alternative is an acceptable option for you and your program. So just a little disclosure there as um, we're sharing best practices today. So for those of you who don't know, my name is Jessica Langley and I'm the Executive Director of Education and Advocacy for NHA. I've been with the organization almost seven years now. Um, I'm a clinician by trade and spent about 12 years in um, allied health higher education in various roles. I'm also happy to be joined today by two of our um, content experts, Michelle Heller and Virginia Ferrari, both of which have 25 years of experience in both clinical and administrative practice and also in healthcare education. So they'll be assisting us with any questions that you have and comments that you um, put into the chat. We also are welcomed today by our um, knowledgeable industry experts as our panelists today. And I will just quickly run through who we have here that you will be hearing from. We have um, Molly Yeski. She's a um, medical assistant and is the program director and an instructor for Lakeland College in Illinois. We have Shelly Writings, who is also a medical assistant and is the medical assisting and HIMC program coordinator from Lewis and Clark Community College in Illinois as well. Wendy Davenport is a nurse and also a healthcare instructor from Walker County Center of Technology in Alabama. And then we have Trisha Berry, who's the Associate Dean and Director of Clinical and Practicum Programs from Purdue Global. So welcome panelists, and we will be hearing from you um, shortly. So let's very quickly talk about how you as a participant and a listener can, can engage with us today. There's multiple ways. You'll see throughout this presentation that you will have an opportunity to submit questions through the Q&A um, format within Zoom, which is at the bottom of your screen with a little icon um, that says Q&A. You can also engage with fellow educators through the chat box. We'll be asking you to do that at various points throughout this presentation and it is sitting um, right next to the Q&A button down on the main um, home bar at the bottom, the toolbar at the bottom. And then we have a polling feature also included in today's webinar that will allow you to select options to particular um, questions that will then lead into some discussion with our, our panelists. So let's jump right in. Um, the first topic that we want to discuss is around just what is the current status of healthcare education? We know that coronavirus and this healthcare pandemic has changed the environment of education dramatically. And we have, if we weren't doing it before, we have moved more towards the online virtual learning in, environment. And there's more than 20 million um, students that have been impacted by this in the higher education space. So as we start to focus on the future state of education, we want to give you, our listeners, 
the opportunity to share some of your thoughts and to hear thoughts from our panelists about the future of education and how the landscape is changing, not only for educators, but for students, faculty, and administrators, and the overall industry as well. So at any point, feel free to share your statements in the chat box on kind of where you think we're sitting today and what we might look like in the near future for the status of healthcare education. And that leads us into thinking about what is the snapshot, the educational snapshot look like for um, our fall semester. And as we have researched some things, we've looked at multiple learning or virtual options that may be put into place. Julie, if you want to go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So lots of, oh, previous one. Lots of options are being discussed. Of course, an on, a fully online virtual environment is an option. Um, we'll look at maybe some hybrid options or discuss some of those um, alternatives. We've heard of schools um, considering doing delayed starts along with, of course, the smaller class sizes and more intimate learning environments to help um, demonstrate social distancing and keeping those guidelines um, front and center. Um, some schools or institutions may be looking at block scheduling, and then the traditional universities are trying to determine what an on-campus environment looks like with some uh, targeted changes, again, to help with social distancing and, and, and decrease the spread of the coronavirus um, for a second wave. So an interesting stat, which is why this webinar is really so important, is um, we see that American campuses largely um, are empty right now of students. We've shut down for the summer and higher education leaders are having to really rethink how they are going to um, educate individuals and what happens with the start of the, the next semester. And statistics do show that 70% of students are not prepared to study virtually. So that's huge when we think about the majority of our students having to operate in a virtual environment right now. Um, however, we are aware that online and distance learning have been and will continue to be a critical component of the educational landscape as we um, move forward. And this is where we want to um, start engaging you and to see just how much of an impact this can have. So we're going to move to our first polling question, and this is for um, all of the participants. And the question is, are you planning for distance learning in the fall? So this is going to kind of give us an idea of we know we've been in distance mode for the summer and the initial implementation of um, social distancing and everything like that. But now, as we've seen a little bit of the curve start to shift, what's the outlook look like for the fall semester? So if you guys can um, make a choice there, are you definitely doing distance learning? Maybe, not at all. And let's see what we get here. We'll give it just a minute for everybody to get their answers in. And Julie, whenever. You are ready. There we go. So definitely comes in at 57% with doing distance learning in the fall with another 40 um, with a maybe. And I don't think that surprises anyone um, with kind of how we are and having to plan this much ahead and just kind of playing it safe as we know we are um, almost kind of preparing for that second wave um, of the virus to come through before we have um, a dedicated um, vaccine for this. All right, so thank you everyone for that. Let's move into some of the challenges that we'll be facing and discussing with our panel today. Um, there are five key ones that we're looking at here. Um, engagement, so how do we engage with students in a virtual environment? Enablement, what tools and resources are being used to help take the place of um, clinical labs, simulations, and externships? Um, how do we get students that externship environment and on-the-job training um, environment and learnings without being able to maybe put them in the externship environment. Um, essential skills, this is a big one. 
we do a lot of research on this and um, wondering what skills gaps are we seeing among students due to the changes in learning environment. So if they're not able to get out there and be in a um, uh, face to face, you know, environment and an externship experience and dealing with patients. How are, how are their essential skills, you know, being affected by that. And then, of course, employability. So what's the employment outlook for new graduates um, entering the workforce and what can they expect. All right, Julie, are you able to um, decrease the poll box. Like close the polling box. I think that's an individual setting, Jessica. Okay. Oh, there you go. Thank you. All right. So let's start by looking at those first two areas together, um, engagement and enablement. And I want to start by asking a chat box question. So this is for all of you listeners to engage with. What have you found um, to be the best ways to engage students within a virtual environment? And as you're submitting your answers, I'd like to get a few responses from our panelists as well. Um, a couple of you, if you wouldn't mind engaging and kind of giving your perspective on this. So what have you found to be the best ways to engage students within the virtual environment? I'll go. Um, really what we, um, when we completed our spring semester, uh, I feel like it was most important that I held um, synchronous meetings with my students via Zoom. Um, and that really helped for the most part, keeping them engaged. Um, our labs right now are on hold, but for the last part of our lecture, um, having them in that synchronous Zoom meeting was very helpful. Great. So we know Zoom has been a big one. Even my um, nine-year-old had daily Zoom meetings, so. Anybody else, any other panelists want to share what's been working for them? Sure, I will. Um, I'll just kind of echo what Shelly said. We also did um, Zoom sessions and I held them for the same hours of what they traditionally would be in the classroom setting. I did create um, some Jeopardy games, some review games that we could do online through Zoom. I would just share my screen and everybody would participate doing that. And I definitely found that helped keep them engaged. Um, we. We um, got our student SimTech simulation, so we would go through those together. And I found that was the best way to keep their attention, you know, versus me just sitting there talking to them and lecturing to them. Having that interaction with them definitely helped the students. Sure, great. All great examples. We're seeing a ton of um, similar examples coming through the chat. Of course, different technology platforms, Zoom, WhatsApp, Google Classroom, all of those things I'm sure are being used um, in a similar way across um, schools. All right, so let's move into um, a little deeper discussion with the panel. And I wanna start with Molly. And I wanna know from you, what are some positives you're hearing from students about having their resources online? So what are they liking about it? Most of my students, um, I, I was kind of scared at first um, that they weren't going to like it or I was going to lose some of my students. Um, but actually, at the end of the spring semester, I had several students, you know, reach out and just thank me for doing the Zooms and being interactive. And they really, they really thought that that helped. Um, you know, I know some instructors that are on the campus, um, not in, not in the MA program, but they didn't do the Zoom. And my students are like, I have friends that you know, didn't have instructors that did that and, and they, they noticed a, a big difference. So I think the students really liked the online environment because we were still able to have class, even though, you know, it was in a different setting. They still got to hear my voice. They still got to see me, um, but, but we were in, you know, our homes. And so, you know, those that had um, children that couldn't go to daycare, you know, we could still have class. They could still learn, you know, with, with their kids and, and their home life. So they really like that versus us, you know, just having to stop completely, you know, and pick up later. So um, my students really, really enjoyed it. Uh, one thing that they really liked was those review games that we did. So again, it wasn't just me standing there lecturing. So, you know, we do those things in the classroom. So I tried to keep it very similar as to what we did in the classroom and what we did on Zoom. That's great. I actually attended a, my first virtual 
conference or convention last week and it was a higher ed convention and one of the stats that they shared or or findings that they shared across some of their career schools was that retention was actually massively higher in the virtual environment than the face to face like there was more engagement and people you know um, interacted more and were more engaged in the virtual environment than they saw in the face to face so that was also i thought a, a really great um, thing to hear as we're kind of navigating these waters. Um, Wendy, I'm going to ask you, where do you think your students are struggling the most in a virtual environment? What are they having issues or problems with? Here with my students, I have found that um, it was internet access. Uh, that has been an issue where we are. We, uh, we are considered a poor county and we do not have internet access all across the county. And for some, it was a matter of um, having a device. And so our um, local businesses, some offered um, free Wi-Fi. And so just finding those resources, that list, um, I was able, actually it came across through our city system. We, we're in the county system. Um, posted a list of businesses that were offering free Wi-Fi. So just giving that list to the students so that they knew where free Wi-Fi was available um, to them uh, to be able to use. And so um, things like that, it was just the, um, giving them the resources to have to, to know where to go and, and, and what to use. Um, mine, when somebody mentioned Zoom meetings and we started out with that, but my students did not receive that very well. Um, just, I had, like less than half the class that would would log in and so I think some of that had to do with having you know wi-fi or, or whatever and, and some it was work schedules some of them continued to work and many of them work for fast food places and so they were considered essential workers and and were out you know doing that so that those were just some of the issues that I found yeah and that's very consistent also with what we heard was technology was really the number one barrier um, for operating within the virtual environment and something that they shared was that, you know, as schools were ramping up what their plans look like um, issuing technology. So whether it was um, iPads or laptops was number one on their list so that they could help kind of remove that barrier and wow. really focus on um, the quality of virtual learning that they were providing, knowing that everybody was set and ready to go from a, a technology standpoint. So um, okay, so let's go to another poll question. This is for all of our listeners to engage in. Um, what have you found to be the best way to engage students within a virtual environment? Which of these do you feel like have been the most productive? Are they live demonstrations? So that would kind of be through Zoom or a similar platform. Um, videos, are you having, um, your students watch videos and then maybe give an assessment or something like that. Um, simulation, I know we mentioned um, SimTech as one kind of resource, simulation resource that has been used. Or if there's any others, um, go ahead and add those into the chat box as well. But which ones do you, which of these do you found to be the best way to engage your students, your students in that virtual environment? Give you guys just a minute. And Julie will put those results up here in just a second. There we go. Okay, so surprisingly enough, a pretty good mix. Um, which is good to see that we have options of what has been working. So um, that's great to see about a 40% split between live demonstrations, videos, and simulations. So we'll dig in a bit more as to um, are there specific products um, or things that help in each of these areas. So thank you all for that. Let's go to the next um, area that we want to talk with with our panelists. Let's move into the area of experience. I think personally, this is by far the most challenging area that we're facing today to tr as we try and teach in place of externships or direct on the job training experiences. 
Um, we understand with the traditional classroom being closed, um, we know educators and students have needed to get creative in order to accomplish the educational goals, including meeting the hands-on objectives. Um, we understand that you're getting ready to tra transition back into the classroom and we've seen um, either partially or not at all. And we want to share strategies for moving forward into the next phase of learning. So Wendy, I wanna start with you and um, have you kind of explain how are you teaching clinical skills um, during, the clo during the closings related to this um, pandemic? So I was introduced to Semtix, which is now SimTutor, um, it, last fall, and um, started implementing this really uh, in January. And so we uh, had started using the, um, the skills demonstrations and, and the students, the simulation skills. Uh, so we started that in January. So we had that rolling when we left, um, left out of school for the pandemic. So um, the, again, the, the other issue was them having their own, you know, device to be able to do that. But um, for those who did, they were able to complete uh, the rest of their skills that were assigned. And what I love about it is just depending on what you're teaching, uh, those skills are already set according to your certification. So like I had some students that were interested in dental assisting and although we don't have a certification for that, there were still skills available to them um, through Semtix that they could use. But primarily for medical assisting, um, I mean from injections to taking vital signs to um, performing a mono test, uh, performing a urine analysis, all these skills, it was great because the simulation, I even have gone through some of them uh, to see how they work. And it, it is really impressive in um, just how it walks you through the skill. You can, you can run an EKG um, on the person. And so it was just really neat um, to me and the kids got it. Um, they, under, they understood it. And so um, Simtix was, our, was like a godsend to me um, for us to be able to, to practice skills outside of the classroom. Awesome. Trisha, I'm going to turn to you. Are you using a similar simulation product to teach clinical skills? And if so, would you mind just talking a little bit about what that is, how you're using the, the product, and what you like most about it? Yeah, so my situation is a little bit different in that we are an online program all the time. And so we have actually used Simtix, which is now SimTutor, for probably four or five years already. And our students have done those skills through Simtic um, since that time. And, um, it, you know, when that product was developed and it came out and we implemented it, it made a huge difference in our online program because it gave students the opportunity to engage with the skills and see what the skills were like before they were going out to their clinical sites to perform hands-on. So we have always, since we implemented that, we've used it as an adjunct to our program. We are using it now, um, kind of in the same way, although in some cases it's the only exposure students are getting because we're having some challenges with placements at the clinical site. Um, but that simulation has probably been one of the key things for us for the last four or five years. So it's actually been kind of fun to watch all the other schools adopt it because it is such a great product. And I'm, I'm not on their sales staff, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Me either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a great way for students to get some practice um, with things. And I actually was just talking to someone yesterday about potential virtual reality things not related to SimTech with another product that students could, there's some development with that in the nursing fields too. So I just, I think there's so many cool things out there that we could be using. And um, I think that this pandemic is going to push development of some of those products a, a little bit faster, which is wonderful. Yeah, it's definitely got everybody's wheels spinning and in innovation mode for sure. Um, Molly, I'm wondering as an instructor, um, were there some challenges related to a transition, you know, and trying to do some of these clinical skills and how did you overcome them? Um, yes, I think the biggest challenge was um, internet access or computer access. Um, the college um, gathered up the resources they had and students were able to come and check out um, laptops. Uh, there also, we had a list from the community of places that students could go for Wi-Fi. 
you know, the college put out, hey, if you come to this place on campus, you know, sit in your car, you get good Wi-Fi access. Um, but after we got those kinks figured out, um, everything seemed to transition really smooth. Uh, what, what I ended up doing, um, you know, we, we all had to allow grace, you know, because we needed it and our students needed it. So there were some days that I would have students that was like, hey, I can't get logged on. Um, and then I just met with that student later. So I'm like, okay, get it figured out whenever you're ready, let me know. And, and I can, you know, go over the lecture that we covered. Um, because I still wanted that student to have their fair share of, you know, listening and getting to do the things that uh, we did in the, the regular class. So um, I, I think just us, you know, extending that to our students, letting them know we are there for them. And that if they were having trouble, you know, letting them know that, hey, we're still there for you. We're not going to kick you out because of that. Um, as the semester went on, and I think once the hype kind of went down a little bit, um, you know, the internet in our area, we had some um, of the internet providers that, you know, upped the, the I don't know the, the techie term for it, but the, so that the students in our area had better access to um, the internet. So that's kind of how we overcome. All, all great things. Shelly, I'm hey, Jessica. If, yes. Sorry, I just want to interrupt for just a second. Yeah. Um, we know how difficult it is sometimes to get administrators to allow you to purchase extra things. Um, purchasing something like the Simtex product, was that hard to get your uh, higher ups to approve that cost? Did any of you have a problem with that? Just wondering, because we know that that's always a, a, a dilemma, right? When you're adding something above your textbook cost. I'll just say our, our admin team was very accommodating for it. And also the people at Simtex were awesome. They had specials going on. Um, so I, did, I, I didn't have any problem. I, our team, you know, we wanted to make sure our students were able to graduate on time because we need people, you know, in the healthcare um, profession. So I think, I mean, we, I had a really good, good luck with that. Great, great, thank you. I'm gonna say the same. Um, it was just a matter or two of I had not used all of my budget, my teacher budget yet, and um, had not used all of my federal money. And so I went to uh, my bookkeeper, my administrator, a career tech director, and um, said, hey, you know, what, what money do I have left to spend? And it was just a matter of that the need for this was maybe more important than something I had budgeted for. And so this took precedence. And, and if I had the money in my budget, I chose to use that instead. And so I got an approval for it and was able, um, able to use that. And like, and like Molly said, Simtix was very great to work with, um, offering a, you know, deals or whatever for us during the time. And even right there before the pandemic, I, had, um, I started out because it was cheaper to have group users. And so I had four students in a group, the only downside was only one person in a group could log on at one time to you to do a skill. And so when we got ready to leave school for the pandemic, I went back to Simtix and I asked them, I was like, hey, this is not going to work because nobody's going to know when somebody in their group is logged on. So can I change over to individual users? And so because we were headed into this whole pandemic thing, um, they gave me a very good deal on individual usership. And so we, I still had some money left to spend and we were able to make that happen before everybody left, um, left school. So it ended up working out really well. That's great. Thank you. Really great. Appreciate it. And I would just tag on to that a little bit since we've been using the product for a long time. I can echo what the others are saying with customer service from Tim Tech. They've been amazing and they've actually, we've gone back to them at times and said, hey, we're having trouble with the skill. Can you develop a new simulation for us? And they have done that. And truly, I promise I'm not on their sales staff, but they've just done a really good job of working on those things. I think for me, when we implemented that, I had to work hard to get it into our curriculum, but I was able to show the ROI of having the students 
practice those skills in simulation and gain competency, gain confidence and gain understanding of the skills before they were out working on patients. And when I could show the ROI for that, for incorporating that into our curriculum, I also showed the ROI in terms of remediation. If we had trouble with, if we had a student who was having trouble with a certain skill, being able to pull that product back in and work with the student on the skill so they could see it in the simulation environment and, and really develop that skill that way. All of those things were things that helped me justify incorporating that into the curriculum. So maybe that would be helpful for some of the folks out there that are trying to make their case. Yeah, for sure. I know in various programs that I've managed, it was always great to be able to provide a student portfolio to the externship site, documenting all the things that they had already achieved competency on, you know, at the school, which, you know, helped ease them a little bit in knowing they have a brand new person coming in with limited experience that's going to be, you know, exposed to patients. That's always, that's always a, a plus. Before we move on, Shelly, I just want to ask you on this one, did you see any opportunity or need to shuffle content around in your program in order to avoid teaching this, the clinical skills online or kind of waiting to see, you know, are we going to get a spot in clinical or an externship site or not? Um, did you experience any of that? Um, I did. Um, we are, we postponed the rest of our skill. The good, good thing for our program, um, we have a 16 week semester. So all of my students had already um, attempted practice for every skill. We had already introduced all of our skill. Um, we were just in the last eight weeks, of course, that we didn't get to complete um, was the time we were really going to focus on finishing, polishing, and, and completing those competencies. Um, externship for, I had um, 21 students that needed to complete externship this summer, and I was actually able to place them in clinical sites. Um, we, we go back to campus next week on Monday to finish out their skill and, and competency checkoffs. So I only had one site that um, was not okay with hosting externship students, but most of our larger employers um, in the area were all about having students in uh, because, like as Molly said, they need these employees. Uh, and if not right now at this moment, th they know that they will very soon. So they were more than happy to accommodate students, even though they were in the middle of finishing um, skill competency and things of that that nature. Great, thank you so much. All right, let's move on to the next poll question. And I'm curious, as we've talked about the different platforms that have been successful um, in getting some feedback from our listeners, I'd like to know what platform are you using to demonstrate your clinical skills to students or having students use to film or practice clinical skills? So are they, you know, taking videos of themselves and uh, doing a skill and, and turning it in to you as a teacher or having peer review or things like that? So are you using just your school's LMS? Zoom, GoToMeeting, Skype, or um, other technologies. Just let, give you just a, a minute here to select that, and we'll see those results here in just a second. All right, so coming in number one and number two is schools, LMS, and Zoom. I, I'm assuming it was probably a mixture of the two. You know, I know we would always use our, our LMS to host um, all of our information, whether that be PowerPoints or, you know, all of our assignments and, and things like that. But then um, incorporating Zoom to kind of have that face-to-face -face, um, engagement with um, our class was great. All right, we're going to throw another poll question to the audience as well. And if a simulation product to teach medical assisting, if using, sorry, excuse me, if using a simulation product to teach medical assisting clinical skills, which product are you using? And here's where this comes in, Simtix, SimX, or if there is another one, another product that you're using, you can type that into the chat box. I think I saw um, some of you entering that before and sharing some of the products that you um, have had good experiences with. 
I'm thinking Simtex is going to come out on top on this one, just based on our feedback from our panelists. Let's see if I'm right. Oh, yes. Landslide victory for Semtex on this one. Um, so really great for those who are looking for a product to kind of have that validation from this group and also from the other members um, joining the webinar today. Definitely something for you guys to check out. Thank you so much for doing those. Let's move into our next discussion area, which is going to go into this. Um, if you're using a simulation product to teach clinical skills, I know we've talked about um, Syntix being that one that most of you are using. Um, how and is it helping to teach non-cognitive skills or how are you teaching those non-cognitive skills and maybe start with Molly on this one? Sure. Uh, so I, I do use Syntix a lot. Um, I also, um, our students, they, they, when they are given a skill, they have to record themselves and they upload it onto our, our college system and then we grade it. We also, I do um, Zoom um, skills with them. So they'll log on at a certain time with me. They're all given a different time and we'll go through some of those, um, maybe not so much hands-on ones. So like a lot of the communication skills, um, you know, legal ethical things, um, you know, they can, they can role play. So they find people, you know, at home or whoever to make these videos where they're given a scenario and then they role play that out together. And then they submit that to me and then we have discussions on them whenever we have our um, weekly classes. Wonderful. Um, is there anything you're using now that you will continue to move forward even when we go back to the, to the if, if and when we go back to the traditional academic environment? Do you think you'll take some of these things back with you because they're working better than you thought they ever would? Absolutely. I will, I think from this point forward, always use Semtex. Um, I have had great success. Again, I'm not a salesperson either for them, um, but it has been an amazing experience uh, for our students. They really, really like it. And I asked my students the other day, actually in class, do you think this would be beneficial for me to continue to use even if we do have, and it was by land side, they all were like, yes, it has been so helpful for them. So I'll absolutely continue to use that from this point forward. Wonderful. Now, Shelly, I'd like to know, how are you thinking about the crisis as you move into finishing up this summer and starting the fall semesters? Um, so our fall semester, our CTE programs have already been told that we will be allowed to be face-to-face. -face. Um, they would like for us to move our lecture as we see fit um, to the online format. Um, and our governor in the state yesterday, um, I'm in Illinois again, um, but he has announced that um, they are planning to resume all, all classes in the face-to-face -face, uh, method. So I think that um, I see light at the end of the tunnel uh, with a little bit of caution, of course, because I think as all of us have learned, um, as soon as you get something set and kind of planned, it changes and the rugs pulled out from under and you're like, okay, where do I go from here? So um, I, I think moving forward, we're going to see some more normalcy and that's what I'm planning for. Um, my goal right now is to finish up my spring um, labs so those students can graduate uh, at the end of next month, which was their scheduled graduation time. So that's, that's our plan moving forward. Um, now we're going to do that web blended version of our program in the fall and um, move forward from there, so. Great, awesome, thank you. Um, let's move in to the next poll question. I wanna make sure we get through everything in our allotted time today. So the next poll question is asking, if students are unable to meet all on-site practicum hours, so if we're not able to get them into an externship environment, what techniques are you using to meet these requirements? Now, we've talked a little bit about this, a simulation product. What about on-site practicum? case studies or projects, transfer of, of prior work experience or volunteer experience or um, others. So if Michelle or Julie can put that next poll question up, 
if you wouldn't mind. Jessica, I think we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. Okay. You can go on with a couple of other things and we'll- You got it, no problem. Thank you. No problem. So with that question of understanding kind of how individuals are um, replacing or meeting the externship needs, um, let's talk a little bit about that. Tricia, I'm gonna start with you um, and ask you, um, have your students in your area, especially since you're online, you may have a kind of a national view on this. Are they still able to go to practicums? What's your black backup plan for students who either can't get an externship or can't meet the required numbers of hours for externship? Yeah, I like the comment Shelly made about we make plans and then and then it changes because the situations are changing. So everything's really, really fluid. And I think for us, there were two concerns. Um, the first concern being the availability of the externship and practicum sites. And then the second um, concern we had is students feeling safe and comfortable going to sites as well. Um, and it was super important to us that we be a somewhat careful about forcing students into situations if they didn't feel safe in those situations. Um, and obviously they're gonna be healthcare professionals and so they're gonna be exposed to the stuff and there's a lot of coaching that goes along with that piece. But you know, if we had folks that had family members that were immunocompromised or um, especially early on um, pregnant women and things like that, we were trying to provide choices. So what we've done for the externship is developed an alternative project we're giving students choices and saying, if you still want to go to externship, we will try to find you a site and place you at a site. Um, if there are sites available in your area. And if you choose to do this alternative project, you can do the alternative project instead. And when we designed that alternative project, we were really looking at, okay, outcomes. What are, what are our normal outcomes of externship? What do we wanna see happening? Um, and then how can we take that and translate that into a project? So we tried to balance case studies um, you, you know, there's a big piece of the externship we all know is soft skills and students learning those interactions and how to work with the patients and things like that. So we tried to do some really dynamic case studies that they would have to work through and talk through in order to uh, expand those skills. Um, and then we had them work on administrative, um, not administrative, sorry, clinical um, processes and basically just outlining processes doing kind of a policy and procedure sort of thing so that they were showing us competency in both areas mm -hmm. it is kind of an odd thing for us because we are a national program we have some areas where we've got students back at sites and it's no big deal and then we have other pockets where sites just aren't accepting students at all so we're having to kind of balance and it really is kind of like Shelly said it's a case-by-case -case thing we make our plans and then we see what comes up and we figure out how to roll with that hopefully serving the students well and also serving the clinical sites and their patients well yeah we um in the discussion last week they said um that problem-based learning was a big one, which is right. kind of the, the projects that yeah. you're talking about, but having that really deep connection with your employers and letting them work on current issues and situations that are impacting, whether it be that department, that practice, and it may not be that patient-centered focus, but it's universally still around, you know, how are we communicating with patients? How are we getting in front of patients? How are, you know, what does workflow look like? What issues are we running into with billing and coding, which could be a, a good administrative project? There were all sorts of that saying that just because we're not able to physically get out there and be in our externship environments, that those relationships are still very key yeah. to help using, you know, creating alternate work and experience environments for, for the students. Any of the other panel members have the situation where externships are not available and what your backup plan was? Uh, we we still had several um, organizations that were partnering, but with the amount of students that we had, um, we were afraid we wouldn't be able to get all the hours for every student. Um, so with the simulation, we also do um, put together case studies um, for projects, so they have to complete those um, as well. So we kind of try to make it, you know, you, you're in the office today and, and this is your patient, this is what they're presenting, and then they, they go through that um, step by step with us. Awesome, thank you. All right, um, yes. 
I was just going to say that um, a lot of people are talking a little bit about what they do to teach soft skills. Yep. And it looks like, um, Wendy, you were the one who put uh, what you use, Smart Work Ethics, to teach soft skills, really good program. They came in and taught the staff how to teach it. At the time, they had a grant that provided all the material at no cost, which is great. Um, I wanted to also let you know that if you haven't had a chance to look at NHA's personability, that's another uh, product. It's a uh, virtual simulation product that we're getting a lot of great uh, feedback on. So if you have any questions, let us know about that. But we wanted to let you know that there is some other types of uh, simulation out there as well. It looks like there's just going to be lots of solutions in the future here. You got it, and a great segue into our next poll question. Um, as we saw soft skills be brought up in, in multiple of our conversations here, and just as a, a, an association that has a lot of opportunity to um, get feedback and do research within the allied health and education space, we do still see as you know soft skills being the most important, yet the, where the biggest gap um, exist. So the next poll question is for everyone and we would like to know how are you teaching essential or soft skills at this time? Are you doing role playing, video and peer review, currently not teaching or other could be, you know, included in part of the simulation tool that we've been um, speaking about. So mark which ones are, are working for you at this time. And while we're waiting, Wendy, I might ask you to expand a little bit on the smart work ethics and um, kind of how that tool has worked for you all. So uh, we were introduced to them, I'm gonna say two years ago um, at our Alabama Career Tech Conference in the summer. Um, they were one of our vendors and um, I had talked to them and uh, was very impressed with their presentation and so, I brought my career tech director back to their table and I said, talk to these people. <laughs> and so he did and um, found out about the grant where they provided everything. And so for one of our professional development days, um, they had a staff person come in and um, talk us through the program and how um, to teach each session. There are 12 sessions and there is a, a student book that goes with it. And so they provided all that. And then there's a teacher kit um, that has everything you need. So there's a particular room set up. They really like for your room to be set up in U-shape form so that everybody is facing um, the speaker. They give you the videos to show in the class. And, um, and it, I mean, it is very detailed as far as when you use the video, when you stop it, what you discuss next, and then when the students write in their, um, write in their student books. And um, so it's a, a very particular uh, program, but it's also very interactive and um, my kids enjoy it. And then at the end of the, of the 12 sessions, um, they earn certificates based on, so during the program, they earn money. You're given like monopoly money and so as they answer questions throughout the, the 12 sessions, you can, um, you reward them with their answers with the play money. And so depending on how much money is earned by each student at the end of the, at the end of the 12 sessions, um, you can, um, it determines like if they're, if they end up being president of the company or vice president of the company or whatever, you know, so, um, but it's very interactive. It has them up and moving, but it has them thinking about themselves and how they can be a better employee. And so I, I really like it. What I like about it is I can determine when I teach those 12 sessions. So if I want to incorporate it every other week, I can, or once a week, or um, I think once a month would probably be too far apart, but um, you can decide when you can choose or choose to teach each lesson. And so that's what I liked about it. I can make it work for my schedule. Really great. Thanks so much on that. And as we see with the polling results, most are doing role playing and some video peer review. Um, for those that aren't currently teaching, I'm sure um, 
you know, Wendy, you sharing that resource, and of course, Michelle sharing um, NHA's personability resource, which also has some virtual simulation in it, are um, all really great options for some of our um, visitors and um, to explore, to just see which maybe works best for them. All right, let's move into the last topic very quickly, and it's just on employability. And Tricia, I think I'm going to ask you to kind of close out um, on these main topics, but um, I, I want to ask about the employment outlook for recent graduates and the future state of, of healthcare education. What do you think that's looking like right now? Yeah, so I think the future of healthcare education, um, I think is then what I touched on earlier. And that is, I think that these products that are simulations and things that help students be online and whatnot, I think those are going to get pushed forward in development. So for me as an online educator, I'm like, this is so cool because people are working at stuff and doing stuff that maybe wasn't moving along so quickly before. Um, so I think that part of it's really fun. It's been fun to see the evolution into online learning. I do think that there will be um, some folks that got a bad taste in their mouth because when all these schools were forced to go online so quickly, that maybe wasn't the best example of what really good online learning can be. And that is no fault to the people who were forced to do that. I mean, it just was a tough situation. Um, and as Molly said earlier, we had to give everybody a little grace. I think we're still having to do that. And so I think that there's there's that piece. I think we're going to see some really good developments on online education, so that's exciting. I think in terms of employment, um, again, for us, what we're seeing is pockets. Like, there are some places where the MAs are being snapped up right away because places really need help. Um, there are other places where things are um, a little slower still because of things that are, are going on with the pandemic. Um, and then the other thing we're seeing is some reluctance from some students. You know, most of these students that are graduating right now enrolled before the pandemic, before there was even really a thought of the pandemic. And so they hadn't necessarily considered um, this type of really difficult situation and what that does to healthcare professionals. And so what we've seen is some students kind of being afraid of going into the environment because of things that could happen from the pandemic. So I think it's going to be really varied and I think it's going to take us a couple of years to really see how things play out for a lot of our students. Yeah, and I know, as we mentioned, it's, you know, there's so much coming out around, um, you know, frontline allied health workers and the importance of them. And there's even national legislation that's been putting that's been put out there to help support whether that be funding for training and, you know, uh, payback of loans, whatever that might be. So we're, we're seeing an overwhelming, um, you know, degree of support from all levels across the country. Um, I know NHA ran a, a really great campaign around our healthcare heroes and, and many of you are doing the same thing. So it's it's so wonderful to hear their stories and, and everything coming with that. We know how important you all are as educators, everyone, you know, joining this call as educators and really preparing the next generation of healthcare workers. So a big thank you um, for all of you for all that you're doing. and. We are unfortunately running out of time. Um, I want to thank everything, everyone, both the panelists and the participants for your great discussion and level of engagement um, today. We're always excited to bring educators, facilitators, employers together um, to learn and share from one another. It's truly the, mis the mission of NHA to empower individuals to access a better future. Some people do that through their teachers. Some people do that through their clinical partnerships. So um, getting you guys you know, all together is, is key for us. We also want you to know to um, please feel free to reach out to us and provide feedback on today's webinar, or if there's another topic that you would like to see us include in the series, we'd like to know that as well. And you can add that into the chat box. Um, something else we would also like to know is, um, would you like NHA to continue doing the Community Connect forums and also how often? Um, once a month, once a quarter, um, things like that. That's all, all very valuable information for us so that we know how to best um, serve and provide information to you all. 
And then of course, again, what topics we should cover in the future and are there topics today that you would like, you know, for us to expand on. So as we wrap up, of course, I think we do have one or two minutes left. If there are specific questions in the chat box, anyone for any of the panelists or ourselves, or just giving you a minute or two to answer those questions about whether you like the Community Connect Forum, how often you want us to do that, and any particular topics that um, you would want to see highlighted um, in the forum would be great. Any closing remarks from any of our um, panelists or industry experts today? We appreciate you guys joining us. Well, I'll just say thank you because that's always important. Thanks to everyone. Thanks to NHA for the invite to be able to share a network. It's always fun to get together with other educators. And thanks to all of you that are, are out there listening. And um, I hope that some of the things we've been able to share are helpful to people. I, I would just too. add, if you'd like to be a panelist in any of our future Community Connect forums, please contact the email address that you see on the screen. Thank love you. Love to have you. Thank you, everybody, for your time and your engagement today. We will see you soon. Thank you. Thanks. You. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, panelists, as well. You guys did a great job. Thank you. Thank you.